significance of Max Weber's legacy, Disenchanting Disenchantment. He completed his second PhD in December 2010 from the University of Virginia, focusing on Max Weber and Charles Beer. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, the accursed. I begin with the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, who is the creator, sustainer, cherisher of all the worlds. And may his peace and blessings be upon his and most of ours, beloved Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I greet you with the universal greetings of Islam, the greetings that we hope to hear when we are resurrected from our Lord, the greetings that the people of Ahl Jannah will greet each other. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've been given the responsibility to speak on the topic of the place of tradition in the globalized world. A few notes, a few disclaimers. What you are about to hear are the reflections of a sociologist. I'm not a philosopher. <clears throat> I'm not an artist. Uh, and along with being a sociologist, I'm a very particular kind of sociologist, an unrepentant, unreconstructed barbarian. <laughs> and I would like to take, tackle this topic from the perspective of the sociology of culture. Max Weber has described culture in the following way, and this is almost a direct quote. Culture, that finite segment from the infinite flux of reality upon which human beings confer meaning. For Max Weber, culture is a finite segment from the infinite flux of reality and on that particular finite segment, human beings confirm meaning. Please keep this definition in mind. We will come back to this definition towards the end of the presentation. The globalized world. When we, are, we use the word globalized, what do we mean or understand by this term? Very often, the phrase global marketplace, global village, these are the two phrases that are used. And we will look at the phrase globalized world from the perspective of the global marketplace or the global village. When we look at the global marketplace, it's understood without, being, without it being needed to be stated that we are talking about modern capitalism, a marketplace that is shaped according to the principles, practices, and institutions of modern capitalism. When the term global village is used, it is used, roughly speaking, with respect to you know, something about modern culture, and when we look at what does it mean, modern culture, how is modern culture, different from, separate from pre-modern culture, something, some vague uh, statement about some human, uh, universal values, 
some vague concept of something called shared humanity. Uh, so something about, very vague, really can't pin them down when you ask them what do these phrases mean, but we will leave that aside. Something about universal values and something about um, shared humanity. So when we look at uh, modern capitalism, what do we see? Again, I am, uh, modern capitalism is far more than I am about to describe it right now. But I think in, us, uh, in order for us to understand the place of tradition in a globalized world, we have to look at this particular part of modern capitalism very, very closely. For those of us who have attention spans uh, that go beyond the latest uh, suicide bombing and the latest corruption scandal, because most of us do not have memories that can go beyond the latest suicide bombing and the latest corruption scandal, our entire world view is shaped by these events. But those of us uh, who have the capacity to think further back uh, I will not ask you to go any further back than, let's say, 1997. In 1997, there was a huge currency crisis which turned the seven Asian tigers into whimpering kittens. The seven East Asian economies were brought to their knees, and some of them have, re uh, some of them have recovered. None of them have recovered completely. And when the question was asked, what caused this crisis, we did not get any answer, other than some vague statements about the expansion of global markets and the expansion of global markets brings certain pain with it, and we must deal with the pain and we must bear with the pain, uh, because, but uh, the, the expansion of these markets in the future, uh, the pain will have been worth it. So some vague statements around that. We still have not gotten a um, um, a really intelligent, coherent explanation of what caused these crises, the, the 1997 crisis. Before we were able to come up, before the, uh, the economists were able to give us some coherent explanation of what caused the 1997 currency crisis in East Asia, we have been rocked by three successive crises of a global proportion in the past five years. We had the crisis of the commodity crises, prices. We had the uh, crisis of the um, housing market in the United States. Then we had the massive banking crisis, which required uh, socialism in reverse. In order to deal with this latest banking crisis, we needed to practice, exercise socialism in reverse to save the collapse uh, or to prevent the collapse of the global economy when Chase, um, keep on forgetting the words because some of them have gone out of business, some of them have merged, but um, the big investment bank, Lehman Brothers has gone out of business, which is the one whose uh, directors are now the chairman of the Fed and Obama's chief economic advisors. Goldman Sachs, okay? So uh, these global capitalists who have been preaching, let the markets determine when it came for their fate to be, de to be determined, what did they do? They ran to the government. Massive bailout. So we had the phrases of too big to fail. There are certain institutions which are too big to fail. And alongside of the uh, emergence of institutions which are too big to fail, we had the explicit emergence, they had already always been there, we had the explicit emergence of experts who are too, uh, experts who are too qualified 
too big to ignore or too intelligent to ignore. So the people at Goldman Sachs, they are too intelligent to ignore. Whatever policy decisions that they made, including, you know, these are the same people whose policy decisions led to the crisis in the first place. We must accept their solutions for the crisis because they can never be wrong. In some ways, I do have to just, I mean, capitalism is far bigger than what I have just described, but just focus on this part of capitalism. We have a crisis in practice and a crisis in understanding. Within modern capitalism, within global capitalism, there's a crisis in practice and a crisis in understanding. Things are happening in the world which the leading experts have no clue. They cannot give us an intelligent description as to why this is happening. The why question is maybe too big for them. How did this happen? They cannot even answer the how did this happen. This is modern capitalism. And in terms of modern culture, I will take a slice for modern culture. Look at modern art. I am nothing more than an educated layperson in the area of art. Uh, there are people in this room who are far better qualified uh, to comment on this. So if I make a mistake here, uh, please bear with me. And again, from within modern art, I will take a very small segment of modern art and ask you to please focus uh, in the focus on this uh, small segment. Um, I feel myself so thoroughly unqualified, I will just uh, read off uh, the beginning part of an introduct, uh, the beginning part of the introduction of an essay by Abdul Hakim Murad. And this is a quote. 20th century Western art is not a subject for which we Muslims have much time. The alert among us are conscious that it neatly represents the decline of the Western Christian worldview and its replacement first with the titanic fantasies of the Renaissance, those absurd nude figures urging us to consider the human creature as sufficient unto himself, and then when two world wars convinced the Western elite that the human creature left to his own devices was unlikely to create his own paradise on earth, the grotesqueries of the modern period. Now this is the part of modern art I would like you to focus on. Today, one of the best known British artists is Damien Hirst, famous for exhibiting a sheep floating in formaldehyde. Hardly less famous are Gilbert and George, two middle-aged homosexuals in gray Marks and Spencer suits who paint vast canvases using their own body fluids. The winner of the 1998 Turner Prize, the most prestigious prize in the British art world, was, was painted with the excrement of an elephant. This is the cutting edge of modern art. If you're not there, you're behind the times. And this is the thing about the modern elite in the Muslim world, they are forever condemned to be behind the times. Everything that they think is modern and advanced, it has already been thrown into the trash bin by the elites in the West. So this is a social group. By definition, the language they use, the terms they use, the fashion which is in place, it is condemned to be behind the times. But so that's a topic for another uh, for another presentation. When we look at modern art and look at it closely, 
Uh, the uh, one other example, which uh, Abdullah bin Murad didn't mention here, because I'm going to refer to it later, is the American artist Robert Mapplethorpe. I don't know if that name is familiar. For him, art is to urinate in a wine glass and put the crucifix, the most sacred symbol in Christianity, in a, in a wine glass full of his own urine, take a picture of it, and that is art. I can describe um, other pieces of art that he has produced, uh, but I am not as modern as I sound, or my accent presents it to be. There is an element of tradition which I still hold dear. And uh, ki wajah se main un tasveeron ki aapke saamne description nahi dunga. But that is art. So how do we understand this? How do we understand these trends or these characteristics of modern art? Leo Tolstoy, in a piece that he published in 1882 titled A Confession, a very brilliant, a very artistic, but a very accurate description of what is happening in modern art. Obviously, uh, Leo Tolstoy was a literary artist. I mean, literature was his area. Uh, he was not a painter, he was not a sculptor, or what is more, soft, more often, uh, most often referred to as art. But I, what, uh, what, what is of value about Tolstoy's observations is they apply no less to other areas of art than they do to literature. When he is describing his own experience as an artist, and especially his experience of being among artists, this is what he says in 1882. He says that we as artists felt proud of ourselves. We felt that we are above the milliards and the masses. Why? Because we were in possession of a knowledge and it was our job to teach humanity how to be more fully human. So we, as artists, are in possession of something that all non-artists need in order to be fully human. And we are the teachers of humanity. Artists look at themselves as teachers of humanity. Again, this is Tolstoy. But after a while, he said, I came to discover that we know that we have to teach humanity, but we do not know what it is that we should be teaching. Because when we are among ourselves, our artists are among themselves in a group, we see that the artists are always bickering and debating. And I don't think I need to detail this. We're all too familiar. Whether you're an artist or an academician, I'm um, an academician, uh, we know exactly what happens. At the end, he uses the term lunatic asylum to describe what we can call the brotherly of artists. Getting together, ek dusre ko shabash dena, ek dusre ko sarhana, aur dusre ko shabash sirf isliye di jaati hai ke aainda mujhe uski shabash ki zarurat hogi. I write a blurb for my colleague, Ijaz Akram, of the latest book he has published, because I know that six months, six months from now, many of you have written here, is that blurb? 
in some crises of practice in art, crises of knowledge, crises of understanding in art. Now the question emerges, is there any relationship between the crises in modern capitalism? Because earlier we said that in modern capitalism there's a crisis of practice and a crisis of understanding. Is there any relationship between that crisis and this crisis, the crisis in modern art? Is there any relationship between Maplethorpe urinating in a glass, putting the crucifix in it, taking a picture and calling it art? Is there any relationship between that and the leading hedge fund manager who last year earned $4.4 billion? The leading hedge fund manager last year, his earnings were $4.4 billion. He earned more in one hour than any university professor will earn in his or her entire lifetime. Is there any relationship between Maplethorpe and this hedge fund manager? It doesn't look like there is any relationship. But if you're an artist, and if you're a good artist, relationship If you are an academician, and if you are half an intelligent academician, relationship Both of these individuals are not tied at the hip, they are tied at the heart. Yeah, what is the relationship? One way to tease out what the relationship is to look at a pre-modern capitalist and a modern capitalist and compare the two. Capitalism is all about attaining gaining economic profit. If you asked the pre-modern Puritan capitalist, the original capitalists, okay, you are working so hard to gain profit, to make profit, why are you working? When you ask this question to the original capitalist, earning economic profit is a sign that I am one of God's elect. It is a sign that God has favored me and he has chosen me. And the work habits and the lifestyle because of which he has chosen me and he has favored me, I must maintain that lifestyle. I must maintain those work habits. Puritan capitalist have aapko ye jawab de. Aap yehi sawal wo Wall Street bankers ko puchein. Wall Street investors ko puchein ke kyu aapne apna khun pasina ek kiya hua hai? Kyu aapne din raat apni ek ki hui hai? Kyu aap itne paise kama rahe ho ke aapko to mauka hi mile gaye paise ko kharch karne ke liye? Kyu kar rahe ho? What answer will you get? I am earning profit for the sake of earning profit. That for the modern capitalist, earning profit is an end in itself. 
So to the question, what is the meaning of economic profit? The Puritan capitalist would say, economic profit is a sign of something outside the domain of economics. For the modern capitalist, economic profit is an end in itself. When we look at the medieval or Puritan artist and compare him or her to the modern artist, we ask the same question. What is the meaning of artistic creations? You are an artist. You create. You create those things. You create those things which the ordinary people don't have. After you create them, they become aware. Okay, reality can have this dimension or that dimension. Or this is there in reality, but you were not able to see it. When you ask the medieval artists, what is the meaning of artistic creation? They would say, when Michelangelo is painting the Sistine Chapel, what is the meaning of this? Why are you torturing yourself? Michelangelo would say, for the glory of God. When you ask a modern artist, you can do what you can do. You can do it. 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 You can What's the meaning of all of this? I think we all know the answer. Why the crisis of meaning? There's a crisis of meaning here. In modern capitalism, in modern art, there's a crisis of meaning. For the pre-moderns, whatever they did, whether it was economics, politics, art, sex, these were all signs of something beyond themselves. For the moderns, politics, economic activity, artistic activity, sexual activity, it is an end in itself. Because of the shortage of time. Really quick, the phrase, art for the sake of art. Economic profit for the sake of economic profit. The use of violence by the state for the sake of using for the use of violence. Don't worry that the use of violence is actually exacerbating the situation which you want to change by using violence. We have the drones, so we have to use them. We have these missiles, so we have to use them. What good is it having all of these the, this this, this technology for committing violence if we're not going to use it. I think it's become clear that the crises in modern capitalism and the crises in modern art are intimately related to each other. They are intimately related to each other. They are not joined at the hip, they're joined at the heart. And if we were to put the crisis into one sentence, it is a movement from relationship and love of the other to the Promethean self-affirmation and navel-gazing. Instead of these activities being a means of building relationship with the non-self, whether that non-self is another human being, that non-self is another religion, that non-self is another culture, that non-self is the non-human natural world, that non-self is the non-human divine, everything that is modern, 
at the end of the day is the destruction of relationship and the destruction of love of the other. There is no two ways about it. Again, please do not let your um, eyes deceive you, your artists, most of you. جو یہ کہہ رہا ہے وہ شاید آپ کو نظر آ رہا ہے کہ وہ مولوی ہے لیکن وہ اس کا ظاہر ہے I began by saying کہ I am an unrepentant, unreconstructed barbarian I have tried to sum up in 25 to 30 minutes Weber's sociology of culture This conclusion I have reached is a purely barbarian conclusion If it is indeed the case that the rupture of relationship and the loss of love for the other is the defining characteristic of modern culture, the question emerges, how is recovery of relationship and love in the aftermath or in the midst of modernity possible? Dr. Suri, has very rightly pointed out that there are limitations in traditionalism, modernism, and postmodernism if we are going to respond to this crisis. He has correctly pointed out that traditionalism and modernism, for all of their other differences, in the end, they are both foundationalist. They are both mirror images of each other. And in the midst of this, postmodernism uh, is the worst of the lot. There is no such thing as grand narratives and meta narratives other than the narrative which I have just enunciated. Do you notice the, the, the contradiction in that statement? Well, not the whole statement. Here's a statement. Do you notice the contradiction in this statement? There is no such thing as a meta-narrative. Any contradiction in that statement? <laughs> yes, no? What's the contradiction? I'm sorry? It itself is a meta-narrative. The very foundation, there's no such no, thing as a meta This itself is a meta narrative. Limitations of time. I began with, uh, with reciting uh, an ayah from Surah Al Hashr. Or, yes, Surah Al Hashr ka ho rubu atri rubu hai. اور حکیم الحمد اللہ محمد اقبال نے کہا کہ میری, میری پورے فلسفہ خود ہی اس رکو کی تشریح ہے اس رکو کی تفسیر ہے اور اس رکو میں یہ ایک خاص آیت ہے ولا تکون کل دین رسول اللہ فانساہم انفسہم اولائکہم الفاسقون and do not become like those who have forgotten God in return God has made them forget themselves Verily, these are the misguided ones. This is not a joke. We cannot sit here passing judgment on others. Whether that other is a fellow human being, whether that other is another religion, whether that other is another culture, whether that other is the non-human natural environment, whether that other is the non-human divine, without we being judged. Every single time we make a judgment, we ourselves are being judged. Yes. For those of us who have made the judgment, there is no such thing as God. Or if there is such thing as a God, He is not relevant for me. Keep in mind, you are also being judged. And you want empirical evidence that we are being judged? We have passed a judgment on the natural world. 
It is there for us to use and abuse as we see fit. Karo hun. Or jena Fukushima de vich baithe ya ki kar rahe hain. Aaj jena BP da oil spill ho ya ki ho hai. Ye jo tornadoes aa rahe hain and again they are saying this is only the beginning. Expect climate change to become more faster, progressive, and more severe. Now we are being judged. So do not become like those who have forgotten God and God has made them forget themselves. That's one part of the Quranic narrative. Where the recognition of and the submission of the self to another. But that is not all that the Quran is about. This could be considered, let's say, the traditional part of the Quran. There is a very modern part of the Quran. An example. Surah Baqarah. Qad nara tafalluka wajhika fis sama falan walli yannaka qiblatan tardaha. Eh Habib, humne dekh liya hai ki aap baar baar apna chehra asman ki taraf uthate ho. Chalo, wo jo qibla tumhe pasand hai, apna ruh us taraf kar do. Here it is not man. It is not man following the command of God. It is God responding to the desire of a human being. Nabi Kareem, this is also that other part of the Quran. خیرت مندوں سے کیا پوچھوں کہ میری ابتدا کیا ہے میں تو اس فکر میں رہتا ہوں کہ میری انتہا کیا ہے خودی کو کر اتنا بلند کے ہر تقدیر سے پہلے خدا بندے سے خود پوچھے بتا تیری رضا کیا ہے this is modernism اے سارے سوڑ مارڈرنسٹا اے جڑے مارڈرنسٹا انہوں نے سمجھ ہی نہیں آسکتی بھی اے کس طرح بھی مارڈرنزم ہو سکتی ہے بھی انسان دا اے مقام انسان کا یہ مقام کہ تقدیر سے پہلے خدا اپنے بندے سے پوچھ رہا ہے کہ دس تینوں کے لئے چیز پسا ہے This type of humanism is theoretically inconceivable in secular modernism یہ انسان کا مقام آپ کو کسی secular philosophy میں مل نہیں سکتا The other part چلے وہ تو رسول تھے ہم کہتے ہیں چلے وہ رسول تھے یا وہ تو رسول کریم کی حدیث مبارک ہے کہ اگر میرے بعد کوئی نبی ہوتا اگر میرے بعد کوئی رسول ہوتا تو وہ عمر ابن خطاب ہوتے رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ اب سوال اٹھتا ہے کہ عمر رضی اللہ عنہ میں اور حضرت علی میں حضرت عثمان میں حضرت ابو بکر میں باقی صحابہ میں کیا فرق تھا یہ جو باقی تین نام لیے ہیں اگر ہم کیونکہ سیرت کا مطالعہ کریں یہ پہلے دن سے شریف بن نفس انسان تھے یہ عمر نے کوئی ایسی بادی نہیں ہے جس کی خود سیر نہ کی ہو عمر بن خطاب نے کوئی ایسی بادی نہیں ہے جس کی سیر نہیں کی اگر نصف بھی آنے سے نو پر مسجد میں نہیں ہے مولوی نے جو کہنا کہنے دے رہے ہیں شراب والی بادی میں اس نے سیر کی تھی عورتوں والی بادی میں بادی میں اس نے سیر کی تھی جوہے جوہے میں اس نے سیر کی تھی جوہے کی بادی میں اس نے سیر کی تھی کوئی بادی نہیں ہے جس میں اس بندے نے نہیں سیر کی تھی تو کیوں یہ رسول ہوتا رسول کریم کے بعد اگر کوئی ہونا تھا قرآن میں چوبیس مقامات ہیں کم از کم چوبیس کم از کم چوبیس ہیں بعض روایات میں چھتیس ہیں کہ عمر نے اپنی رائے رسول کریم کو پہلے دی بعد میں ایک بہی آئی کہ جو عمر کہہ رہا ہے وہ صحیح ہے
कम से कम 24 शायद छत्तीस ऐसे मकाम हैं ये भी कुरान का एक हिस्सा है आई बिलीव इन एयर यस मॉडर्न कल्चर इज इन स्टेट ऑफ डीप क्राइसिस एंड यस ट्रेडिशनलिज्म मॉडर्निज्म एंड पोस्ट मॉडर्निज्म देर डेर एंड देन आई कैन टेक एस एनी वर्ड I will leave you finally with these two Surah Hashr or Ya Nabi Kareem or Hazrat uh, Hazrat Usman ki sirat se pointers what is possibly a hopeful way out wa aqru dawana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Sort of things. I mean, you know, gender equality and this. You know, all of the ideologies 
communism by the communists, feminism by the feminists. They consider these things, you know, they're ready for all these things. A capitalist is ready to kill and die for capitalism. And so the idea of sacred in its perverted form exists in the modern world also. And this is because the human soul itself has a yearning for its original home, which itself, from a traditional point of view, is sacred. And if you don't give the, the human soul that food in form of the worship of the sacred, it will nonetheless find things to worship on a lower plane. And so, I, think, I hope that it's Uh, 
in common substance uh, because the subject itself is sacred. We could call it sacred art. Plus, I mean, this is something that was first done back in North Africa in the 17th century. So we consider it at once as sacred and traditional. Now, consider it with uh, maybe a small dagger from the times of Genghis Khan. There's nothing sacred about that dagger. But uh, it was not mass produced in a steam factory. It was carefully crafted by one of the best dagger makers who made daggers for ordinary men, but also made a special dagger for Telugu Khan, for Genghis Khan. And, uh, converted that ordinary utility object into a piece of art. Well, that's traditional art. So arts in Latin and techni, which is to make things, are combined in ways the utility, the sub objects of utility on a daily basis have this uh, aesthetic character in, in traditional times. Um, I'll give you another example. I come from a little village in Sagoda, I in Punjab. And uh, when we were going up, this tarpai that we sit on has these four posts that were very beautifully made. They're still very beautifully made. Uh, the new tarpai is made of steel. And it's not very nice to uh, uh, It has these plastic, uh, synthetic plastic things that are rolled through it. And if you sit on, and this, this takes less forever as steel as opposed to wood. And I've even seen the leather ones actually, the ones that are woven through with leather uh, in the middle. Uh, so th this is uh, an ordinary object of utility, but an element of art uh, in the fabrication of that object made it at once a piece of utility as well as a piece of art. So, uh, you know, and the, an average person uh, who was a sane, a person who was doing the sana in the industry, is at once an artist. So now, <coughs> a, a person who is uh, a maker of things technically not necessarily an artist. Um, but in the traditional times, every maker was also an artist, which is why the term um, sana is interchangeably used in Arabic for art and industry. It's one of the same thing which is now the I don't think that it's a thing. So we have uh the next presenter with the gear. That's enough to be the party. God, 
that it has not been possible to be this close to God और ये भी देखें ये वो आयत हैं ये वो रिवायत हैं जो मौजूद आपको नहीं बताएंगे नहीं सिखाएंगे विश्वास शरीफ की तकरीबन बिल्कुल आखिर में एक दूसरे दिनों की रिवायत आती है कि वो सहाबा के साथ बैठे थे और सूर्य करीम ने सहाबा से पूछा कि पूरे मखलूक में किसका ईमान सबसे खूबसूरत है आजमुल ईमान इसका ईमान सबसे खूबसूरत है सहाबा ने कहा कि मलाइका का रसुलगरी ने जवाब दिया कि उनके ईमान में क्या कमाल है वो तो अपने रब के हजूर में होते हैं तो जो उनका ईमान है उसके उस ईमान में क्या कमाल है फिर साहब ने कहा कि जी अगर मलाइका का ईमान नहीं सबसे खूबसूरत तो फिर जो रसुल हैं या अम्बिया हैं उनका ईमान तो जवाब आया कि जो रसूल है अम्बिया है उनके पास ईमान क्यों ना उनके ईमान में कौन सा कमाल है जब वही उनके ऊपर नाजर होती है फिर साहबा ने थोड़ी सी जरूरत की और कहा कि ठीक है अगर मलाइका का ईमान या रसूल का ईमान नहीं सबसे खूबसूरत तो हमारा उस टीम ने कहा कि तुम्हारे ईमान में क्या कमाल है जब मैं तुम्हारे माँ बहन हूं और तुम ईमान आ पाओ क्या कमाल है तुम्हारे ईमान में फिर उस टीम ने कहा कि सबसे खूबसूरत ईमान उन लोगों का होगा जो तुम्हारे बाद आएंगे वो उन, उन वो बरके पाएंगे जो बर, जो वर्कों के ऊपर लिखा हो उसके ऊपर ईमान लाएंगे सो हियर दी जो हायर आर्टी में बताई गई है उसको फ्लिप कर किया जाए दुराने नैरेटिव एंड ट्रेडिशन दे कंटेन दिस कैपेसिटी to bring life out of death modernity is death modernity is death but dealing with death in a particular way treating it in particular sin is death but after you have sinned you have the ability and the capability to bring life out of it so yahan pe hazrat umar बाकी सहाबी सहाबियों से खास तौर पे जो जो चार हैं उनमें से बहुत उनसे बहुत मुख्तलिफ हैं कि बाकी तीन थे हमेशा जिंदा थे सो यू हैव इंडिविजुअल एक्सपीरियंस द डेथ ऑफ सिन बट ही and for me that perfectly matches on to the modern experience so sir so only within that context baki or some according to some other uh criteria wo hierarchy aur hogi hazrat umar niche aayenge koi aur hierarchy hogi hazrat usman upar honge theek hai main par dekhi hum associate hain jaisa hamara mere to mere ki laje ko position ye laje ki aap log karte rahe that's not my business I think as a sociologist, I can construct different hierarchies, as with at which Hazrat Dumar is on the top, another hierarchy at which Hazrat Abu Bakr is on the top, another hierarchy at which Hazrat Bilal is on the top, another hierarchy at which someone who didn't see the Prophet during his lifetime, Abbas Karni, is on the top. So I'm not. I don't care about any the, the, the theology or theological positions. I'm a very <laughs> 